from the Medina community where the journalist was shot and killed in cold blood. My colleague Maxwell Agbaba was in the community and is with me right now in the studio. Maxwell, you've been to the crime scene since morning. What yeah. did you gather? We had about 15 personnel of the criminal investigation department um, visiting to pick very um, important, you know, evidence connected um, to this case. And they were also, they also had interactions with um, some of the people living in the neighborhood um, to find out from them exactly, you know, um, what they saw. And what they've been telling police is that um, they had the gunshots um, in the area, but they thought uh, it, it, they were firecrackers. So a lot of them did not respond immediately. It was later that the alarm was raised that someone had been shot. That was the point that um, they rushed to the scene. Um, speaking to them also, they tell us that they saw um, the assassins, you know, in the neighborhood for six good hours. Um, one of the ladies, women we spoke to, um, said they saw them um, sometimes around 3 o'clock p.m. She says her mother even raised concern that these are strangers in their community. They didn't know them from anywhere. But what they did not do was to confront them and then ask them questions. So it was sometime around 9 p.m., 10 p.m. That was when um, they had the shooting, you know, in the neighborhood. Um, and one of the ladies there actually saw the people she had seen um, at 3 p.m. who had actually gone to one of the pubs in the neighborhood to actually buy a drink. Yeah, in the community. The, there was a bin there at the wall, behind the wall. So they came there and they packed the motor and they sit on it. Mm. So we were sitting here, here from 3 o'clock to 9 p.m. in the evening. So my I came out that time, like 8 o'clock, and my mom told me, say, some two men came here. Mm. They were sitting there for so long and they don't know who they are. Mm. So as to, we didn't do anything because we, didn't, we, we don't know them. Mm. So we are sitting here and for 9 o'clock, 9 p.m., 9.30. Mm. Like we saw them moving their motor. Let's say 10 p.m., mm. give them the direction. So I was standing at the roadside with my brother. Mm. And the motor was parked at the roadside behind the signboard mm. on the left. And I saw a car coming back from me, behind me. And I was standing at the roadside making a call. So what I know is the car parked at the junction, looking the other side to the other side. He was about to turn on the left, on his left, right, uh, his left, to a taxi rank. Okay, so I was standing there watching the driver and the motor guys, two guys. So one of them was standing at the standboard the, on the left, where the driver was about to blanch. And I saw the man point a gun on the driver, on the right, the left side. So he shot the gun, and the driver step the distance what do you call it the, the accelerator mm. so he was about to blanch when the gun hit the person so he goes straight and the middle of the road he went back there and shot the gun the second time so the guy goes straight to the water straight to the store and the guy went back there and shot him the, sec the third time mm. so that time when, when after that a guy wanted to approach them when they pointed the gun at them, wanted to shoot them if any, anybody come close to them. So we were standing there and watching them. We didn't do anything. All the cars which was coming, passing and going, all them stopped. They, they couldn't approach them. So we were standing there watching them when they left and we went to the car and we called the policeman, but not police. Uh, these are really fascinating details. It, it paints a picture of a premeditated killing mm. because it did the first two shots exactly the the mm. as you described the leg was an accelerator the yeah. car okay. moves so, yeah so according to eyewitnesses um uh, the lady who actually witnessed um the shooting um there was a first shot to the um, car window and then um the second shot that was the point when his leg, we are told that his leg was on the accelerator. So the, so car, the car moved forward, the bed, forward. went forward and then crossed the streets to a point and then hit um, a salon which is just some meters away from where the first shooting happened. And these assailants then followed up. Followed up and then gave a third a shot. Third shot. There was a guy we are told, there was a gentleman we are told confronted the man but he had to retreat because they pointed a gun at him. So I see. He had to retreat. I, I, and you've also been speaking to the family. What yeah. have they been saying? Well, 
a lot of some of some of the family members actually fell short, you know, of mentioning names, although they are pointing fingers um, to a legislator um, in, you know, um, Ghana's um, parliament. They did not mention names. Some mm. of them we also spoke to actually mentioned, you know, one of Ghana's MPs and said that he had threatened, you know, him in the past. So they are putting the blame right at his doorstep. He's saying that they are giving um, the Ghana police service one week, less than one week, to find the perpetrators, else they'll be forced to respond. Pond. After work, we all gather at this place. That's where we just sit. Sometimes we can sit there till 2 o'clock a.m. before we all disperse. That is when it's Friday. That's weekends. We can sit up to 2 a.m. before we disperse. And yesterday, what happened is that we were here and when he received a call that one of his children is, uh, is not feeling well. So he re reported that he was going to take the the boy to the hospital so he took his car as he was approaching the junction uh, we heard a gunshot so we were saying oh uh, why are they still doing knockouts when the christmas is over and before we could realize a gentleman ran towards us and said oh they have killed your brother we rushed to the scene and we found him in the car i think because uh, they shot him he was forced to cross the road and hit the other store. We are calling on central government to ensure justice is done. This is a threat to all the journalists in this country. This is a threat to justice. And government must use its authority and ability and capacity to ensure we get that justice in time and not... There, there should be no delays on this. The guy has a family. The, the family has no authority. We don't have the capacity to fight whoever has made threat on his life. Those who have the world without money and political power we are sure they are behind us but as to who specifically we will not be able to mention and that is why we are relying on government heavily to ensure we get justice or else we ourselves will demand the justice in a way that is appropriate to us justice must be given to us as immediate as possible and that is what we demand for people cannot just come out and start killing individuals just because they have authority and power guns we have no idea where they got their guns from. We have no idea who authorized them to come and do the killing. But what we know is we are powerless, but God is there. And God is with us in this fight. And government must be with us or else government will be exposed. If government wants us to have peace, government wants us to have peace in this country. Criminals of this sort must be tracked down. So we are pleading with government to do the right thing. But everybody is more or less exposed to the facts out there. Evidence is out there. People have made threats on TV. But because of security reasons and caution of police, we will not be able to speak to them. I am sure the police service will investigate and call all persons that they deem fit to be investigated.